Good afternoon, everyone. Hi there. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming on this wonderful, snowy, windy, awful day. <laughs> you all get gold stars for being here. Um, for those of you who don't know me already, my name is Corey Fabian Bornstein, and I'm the Pro Public Programs Coordinator here at the NHA. I'm very excited to welcome you to this week's edition of Food for Thought, featuring local historian Fran Kartunen. Uh, as always, I just want to take a moment to thank you all for supporting this free community program. It is, has sponsorship from the MS Worthington Foundation and special media sponsorship from Novation Media. Today we'll be looking at a little insider look at Fran's book, Nantucket's North Shore, looking behind the scenes, things that didn't make it into the book, all of that. Uh, before we get started with Fran and her book, if you could take a moment to silence or otherwise turn off your cell phone so it doesn't disrupt the presentation, that would be marvelous. While you're doing that, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about our presenter today. Uh, Fran is actually a 12th generation Nantucketer, descended from the first English settlers to come to the island in 1659. After graduating from Nantucket High School, Fran attended Radcliffe and Indiana University, spent a year on the National Science Foundation grant in Los Angeles, and then spent 31 years at the University of Texas in Austin. During that time, she carried on research projects in Mexico, Finland, and Hawaii from the University of Texas Linguistics Research Center. Since retiring here on Nantucket, Fran has written half a dozen books on Nantucket history, starting with The Other Islanders, People Who Pulled Nantucket's Oars, which came out in 2005. <coughs> Nantucket's North Shore, a neighborhood history, which she's gonna talk about today, took her 20 years from original concept to publication. Sorry about that opening noise. I'm not sure what the, the sorry. Um, currently, Fran is working on a history of the Nantucket Civic League, and following her talk with us today, she's gonna be over in the bookshop signing many of her books. Unfortunately, because of the weather, the shipment of Nantucket's North Shore didn't make it to the island. So hopefully, you'll come back again when we get that shipment in to get that book. But we have pretty much every other book Fran has written, if you're interested in taking a look at those. And Fran will be here to sign them. So please join me in welcoming Fran Cartoonin. Thank you. Thank you. Well, for is, is this good? Is that hard? Fortunately, um, since I live here, anytime you want a book signed, <laughs> I'd be happy to come over here and do it. I, I'm, I'm really quite gratified that the museum shop sold out because I know they had a lot of copies. <laughs> and that's really why I decided to show you today things that aren't in the book because I have a hunch a lot of you already know what's in there. And as Corey said, it, it really did take 20 years from concept to publication. Uh, in 1994, I inherited a collection of old Nantucket recipes, and I thought I should do something with them, maybe a little booklet to benefit the Athenaeum. Then soon after, I was asked to contribute an article about uh, the North Shore restaurant to the Radcliffe Culinary Times. And writing that article made me think of something a bit grander to do with the recipes to somehow put them into historical context, neighborhood context, after all. They were North Shore recipes. And then other things fell into place. Um, doing my first Nantucket book with Spinner Publication of New Bedford in 2005 and working with Spinner's brilliant young book designer, Jay Avila, and then developing a working relationship with Alan Reinhardt on a number of projects and appreciating his photography and growing familiar with the miraculous resources of the Nantucket Historical Association's Historic Image Arc database. So I knew I wanted to do a North Shore book and the, as a spinner book designed by Jay and then I could turn to Alan for some contemporary photography. So for practice, I did a little self-published culinary memoir, which also has the name North Shore in the title. It's called Good Things from Nantucket's North Shore. And that one has pictures of my family and 20th century recipes in each chapter. So when doing this, I achieved the tone that I wanted, but it lacked the great production values of a spinner book. Then I had to convince Joe Thomas, the publisher at Spinner, that it would be worthwhile for a New Bedford publisher to take on a picture history of a Nantucket neighborhood with recipes. 
That's not exactly an orthodox prospectus, but Joe and Jay got on board. And then there was the fundraising. I had done it for three Nantucket books, a couple of mine and one of Barbara White's. And I hereby publicly state that I have now permanently retired from asking people for money. Uh, finally, after a 20-year gestation period, the new book came out last June, and it couldn't have been accomplished without the help of a great many people. And to each and every one, once again, I say thank you so very, very much. And now on to the slideshow. I, I have done a number of presentations already about the book, so at this point, I'm about to show you things that for one reason or another aren't there. And um, here we go. Um, color. <laughs> It's a black and white book, and all the vintage photos are in black and white, but some of the original contemporary ones are in color, so I'll show them to you. Uh, pictures that were left out, a sequence that there was no room for, even though I wanted it very much, and a story I found too late to include. But first of all, I have to tell you about a couple of things that are in the book. Oh, bad dates. <laughs> I commissioned um, Preservation Institute of Nantucket architecture student Carol Litvinus to make this drawing of the hypothesized original appearance of the Jethro Coffin House, the oldest house built for the 1686 wedding of Mary Gardner and Jethro Coffin. And in the caption on page 41, my own doing and absolutely nobody else's fault, the date of construction is given as 1659. Ouch. If you have the book already, please fix that one. <laughs> and then this photo was taken from the North Church Tower and in the archive, it's dated to the 1880s, and I was working from a fairly small screen. And only when it was published as a spread did I see that little black thing on the horizon off to the left. Oh my gosh. It's the one comet water tower that was built in December 1908. <laughs> And then I had asked um, Dick Brooks if there were any pictures of the Brooks family farm, and he said no, but right there in the middle on the left is the farmhouse for the Brooks farm that was built in 1909. So the date on page 17 should really read circa 1910. Also, this, this is a good um, example. Let me go back a minute of what Jay can do because there's a little black thing on the horizon, but you can also see a little white thing on the horizon. That's a floor in the photograph, and Jay is so spectacularly able to restore old photographs that printed as a spread in the book, you don't see that little white flaw at all. Now, on to the good stuff. Alan Reinhardt took more photos for the book than in the end were used, um, and they were all in color. And then Alan um, changed them to black and white, and then Jay messed around with them some more, but I'm going to show you the beautiful originals. This is the Madiket Monument at the end of North Cambridge Street in Madiket, which marks pretty more or less the place where the first English settlers spent the winter of 1659-1660. And the, uh, the map of Nantucket design is by Morton Reva Schlesinger. And for those of you who know Reva, today is her 92nd birthday. Um, and then we put in a quote from Nantucket historian Obed Macy about how the English settlers and the Nantucket Wampanoags became bilingual in each other's languages. Um, Spinner chose for picture of the Madiket ditch a winter one with ice along the sides, 
but Alan took this very pretty one uh, with blue sky and uh, it's quite lovely. This Madikit ditch was a um, joint project undertaken in the early 1660s, 60s of creating a herring run from uh, Hither Creek to um, Long Pond and the Wampanoags and the English um, did this as a cooperative project. Somebody asked me, well, why did they do it? And I said, because there are herring runs on Cape Cod, but there was not a natural herring run on Nantucket. And until the English arrived with metal tools, shovels and the like, uh, the Nantucket Wampanoags were incapable of creating an artificial one. So one of the first things that the English and the Wampanoags did together was create this herring run which is not currently used because there is a um, moratorium on taking alewives, herring, but it was maintained by the town. There was always an article in the budget for maintaining the um, Madigat ditch right up into the 60s, and I'm not too sure since then. But the fact of the matter is it remains open, and I think it would be sort of cool someday to have a whole lot of people in kayaks on high tide. <laughs> kayak for, from Heather Creek to Second Bridge. Um, these are the monuments at the Founders Burial Ground. The men's monument was erected in 1881. And um, as one of the acts of celebrating Nantucket's 350th birthday, um, the burial ground there in the hill overlooking Maxie's Pond was called by an awful lot of names and so it was decided that it would be given an official town name, Founders Burial Ground. And as we were dedicating it in the summer, uh, I mentioned that there were these men's names on the men's monument, but every one of those men had a wife and I had looked them up and I discovered that those women had, 20 women had do, uh, contributed 80 children to the next generation of Nantucketers, and I thought they deserved a monument too. And um, our town clerk sort of led the effort. She um, posted a sign outside the town's clerk, town clerk's office and said, donate five bucks towards putting up a women's monument and write the name of a woman who's important to you outside the door of the town clerk's office. And the list got long and another page got put up and another page until the walls were plastered. And before the end of the year, we had this rose pink women's monument to honor those first settler women and also all of Nantucket's women and children. And this is uh, Alan's photo of it in the, um, in the late fall, so you can see the um, winter berry behind it. It's a lovely spot. Now this is the Tristram and Diona's Coffin Homestead marker on Kapam Pond Road. It's broken. Uh, Spinner chose to use a 1935 photo, and I thought that was when the marble plaque was intact, but really looking at that photo, I think even then the bottom of the plaque was broken. It's badly in need of replacement. And if this is done, then instead of saying Homestead of Tristram Coffin, it surely should say Homestead of Tristram Coffin and Diona Stevens Coffin, because without Dionys, there would not be all the descendants of Tristram Coffin. And then another family of uh, early settlers is, um, is honored just off Madikit Road. You get to it by turning on Wana Comet Road. And there's a commem commemorative bench there uh, honoring um, Peter Folger and his wife and their daughter, Abaya. Uh, who was the mother of Benjamin Franklin. And this bench was originally set there in the late 1950s, and the current bench is a replacement, I notice. Um, so it's a little uh, out of the way, but well worth visiting. And this is a pond that um, Alan and I had to do a little bit of trespassing to photograph. 
Uh, it used to be perfectly visible from what used to be called West Chester Street Extension. Uh, you go out West Chester Street beyond New Lane and uh, traveling west on what we used to call the extension, this is right on the right, and it used to be in perfectly plain view. But since houses have been built around it, it's much in the interest of the homeowners to have uh, small trees and bushes growing up between the pond and the road. So now it's not really visible from the road. But the, uh, the thing about flag root pond is it refers to a plant that uh, was used to make candy I included the recipe, but I also don't recommend making it because, frankly, flag root is somewhat toxic. <laughs> <laughs> What's something has next? I'm, I'm afraid I have. Can you just? Yeah. Um, the, the recipe says to boil it and throw the water away, thank you, <laughs> many times, and there's a good reason. Um, there, there are black and white photos of it growing and of the plant, and you can see the root there. Uh, but really, without color, it's hard to recognize sweet flag. It's just a very distinctive green, and it grows among other water plants as well, so color helps. Uh, in the book, we have a um, uh, receipt from Obed Macy's um, medical book and um, what happened was uh, that they, the Spinner chose a, um, a cure, really, uh, for dysentery because it had the date on it. Uh, but this, this is another bit of it that Alan photographed from a document, and um, I'll read it to you. An Indian remedy for the king's evil, which was scrofula, which is a skin disease. So it says, take the inner bark of the bayberry bush, pound it soft, and apply it over the scrofulous swellings and sores morning and evening, and drink a strong tea made of bayberry bush leaves four times a day. The cure was accomplished in two weeks. Well, scrofula is a name given to a number of skin diseases, most of which are caused by tuberculosis. It causes swellings and sores, typically on the side of the neck. And in the past, it was believed it could be cured by the touch of the King of England or the King of France. <laughs> I imagine the King really enjoyed his day, <laughs> special days for touching the scrofulous. But hence the name of the King's evil. Today, when the underlying tuberculosis is treated, the skin condition usually clears spontaneously. I think it's interesting that they had turned to the Nantucket Wampanoags and the local bayberry bushes for a cure. Uh, this is a centenarian catalpa tree on West Chester Street. Uh, in the picture here, you can, you can see some of the white flowers in, in the tree. Um, this tree was a mature tree that we all climbed when I was seven or eight years old and it's still there, and it, it's now become a very, very venerable tree. All the catalpa trees were brought to Nantucket in 1911 as part of a promotion for Gilchrist department store in Boston. And the ones we have today are either more than 100 years old or are the offspring of these trees. And I've noticed not far away from this tree there are at least three seedlings growing over on the Gull Island side of West Chester Street. So as the old ones finally uh, pass away, we'll, we'll have new ones. And there is the very pretty sign for the offshore animal hospital. Uh, reduced to black and white, it's not a terribly <laughs> exciting sign, but it's a very pretty one in color. And um, I guess this one is just a little too cryptic. This is the hillside above Lily Street where there's a seep spring that was named for Dinah Daggett. Um, and 
and, and Spinner just found this too obscure. Uh, I knew I knew the name of the spring. I'd known it as a child, and I couldn't recall it. I just could not recall it. And one day, as I was walking along Seta Street by the intersection of Lily Street, suddenly the name came back. I said, Dinah Daggett. And then I went to the Barney genealogy and uh, learned about Dinah. Um, and I found a little snippet uh, about children who would go to Dinah Daggett's house. And because this creates a sheet of ice in cold weather down the side of the hill and then along Lily Street, uh, children would go up to Dinah Daggett's house and use coal shovels as sleds and take a tremendous ride down the side of the hill and along the street. Uh, Dinah Daggett, by the way, according to um, the, the genealogy, um, had three children out of wedlock before she married um, Daggett, then had two more children, and then the whole family moved to Sandwich, where they were uh, an upright uh, community members, and nobody seemed to hold it against them that the first three children were born without benefit of marriage. Seven, they demolished the paddock house and used material from it in the restoration of the uh, Jethro Coppin house, um, probably putting that missing back piece on. Again, one sort of thinks, surely they wouldn't be able to do that these days, to demolish a 1726 house. But here's a, um, the, the painting on the cover of the book is of the paddock house, and here's a photo. You, again, you can see the sea cliff in flying its flag in the background. Um, it's interesting to me that the flag is quite clear, but that the two people in the picture are blurry um, from movement because it was a long exposure photo and the people. Uh, if we look and look carefully, it seems that they're picking berries from the bushes next to the house. The, one, one figure um, is a woman in a long skirt with an apron and she's leaning forward and the other person only has one clear leg, but we're sure there was another. You know, for the guy who does the ghost walks, that would be a wonderful photo. <laughs> the, go the ghosts uh, of Sunset Hill. Uh, since the book came out, another photo of the house has been added to the uh, image archives at the NHA. And um, this one could very well be the model for the, uh, the painting on the cover. Because as you, you see, compare the photograph and the cover painting, the painting was done in 1901 by a British artist named Holston, who apparently visited Nantucket briefly, did just a few watercolors and moved on. But fortunately, this watercolor stayed here and I purchased it eventually. He, the, the owners were trying to sell it on commission and nobody would buy it because it was clearly not the Jethro Coffin house and it wasn't the Elihu Coleman house. And so people said, well, either it's a very bad picture or it's not of anything to use the current buzzword, iconic. And so no one would buy it. And after about three years, I made a bid on it, something I could afford and I was fortunate enough to have it. The thing about it is that my mother and her siblings must have played around it as children. And yet, as soon as it was demolished, it seems all memory of that building was lost. Nobody ever said, remember the old paddock house? Or you remember when they tore down the old paddock house? Not a word. It just vanished from public memory. And uh, I sort of wanted to bring it back. Now, in the distance behind the paddock house, you can see houses that are along Cliff Road, just the backs of them there. Uh, you can also see Kate Stout's house <laughs> as you go down the lane. Um, but that middle house of the three in this photo taken on Cliff Road, or North Street as it was called, 
would have been 14 cliff and it's been gone for a long time. There's now there's just a nice big lawn for 16 cliff. Um, and in this photo, there are actually two little sapling trees at either corner of that house that's now gone and they're still there. They're old trees now, but they're still there. But I, I, when I did the book, I didn't come across what uh, Judith Coffin Gardner Tewksbury had to say. She said that that middle house was inhabited by Aunt Mary Cottle, and uh, that she was a small woman who would walk around the streets muttering to herself and picking up pieces of wood out of the street. And when she entered a room, she sat in every chair there. She was harmless, however. <laughs> and so I looked them up in the Barney genealogy and I found that Aunt Mary Cottle had a brother and neither of them ever married. And she did not look to be really, a really old woman. And I just thought of these probably two rather eccentric people living in that house. Um, and sometime, not so long after 1900, it was removed, but I think I can see it among the houses in the background of the photo of the paddock house. And here's another view. This was going to go in the chapter about the lily pond and it got bumped for reasons of space. But it's looking across the lily pond and some cows grazing there to the houses on North Liberty Street, which are not exactly on the North Shore. They're in a neighborhood called Egypt. And right now, the tall house and uh, the one to its um, left are very much in contention because of the developer's desire to get permission to... Well, at first he wanted to move the two old houses, and now he has a plan to leave the two houses in place, but to build spec houses around and between them which is really distressing to people who live here. Um, so I sort of wish that it had stayed in the book because it might have been helpful to uh, the neighborhood in their efforts to preserve their streetscape. Um, and then only very recently, I got a letter from Bill Hoadley whose memoir is excerpted in little snippets throughout my book and he said, he is the boy in this photo walking towards the North Shore restaurant. And if only I'd known, I would have been more than happy to uh, include that in the caption. I should say that when Bill graduated from Nantucket High School in his senior year, he won the NHA Nantucket History Essay Competition and, and his essay was printed in the Proceedings of the Nantucket Historical Association, and it was a history of Nantucket's newspapers. Um, I, I like his memoir, uh, Please Walk Your Horses Up This Hill. That was a sign that was on the corner. I think he writes very nicely. Um, and, and really, looking back at his essay on the history of Nantucket newspapers, that's a pretty good contribution to Nantucket history as well. And now we come to something that just could not work it out in the book design to do, but one, swimmers in their bathing suits, or as they were being called then, their bathing costumes, sitting on the rocks at the jetties. Secondly, people coming back from the jetties, walking up the uh, boardwalk that the Sea Cliff Inn had built so that people could come and go, because you never went out or back on the streets, have them help you in your bathing costume. You changed into your street clothes um, in the rooms provided. And the third picture is of those rooms uh, at the beach and in the, behind them, the clotheslines where all of those bathing costumes have been hung out to dry. Uh, we do have the, the picture there of the drying um, bathing suits, but it's sort of been exiled to the end of the uh, index. And now, haha, the grand finale. I was not aware 
of the photo that's coming up when we did the book. And I'm not sure I would have included it, but it's a photo of Edward Stackpole, the uh, Nantucket historian, whaling historian, one time director of, of the Nantucket Historical Association, with his two young children, Eugenie and Rennie, at a North Shore beach. That's what it says on the back of the photo. And that is Edward Stackpole as I never recalled him. <laughs> and, and Rennie, much younger than I recall him either. However, that said, there's another photo that might be taken on the same day. And uh, here's Edward and the children, but look at the gen gentle surf behind them. That's not the way the water comes into the North Shore. And I wonder, because the children's grandparents um, it was the keeper of Sanctity Light and his wife, um, I really wonder if they weren't visiting the grandparents that day, and this is the beach at Sanctity. And there's a possible way of knowing, because in the one that's labeled North Shore, there are two houses on top of the bluff those two houses, and if we could identify those two houses, we would know whether it was the North Shore or whether it's on Sankety Bluff. So many, many thanks to all, and particularly to the people here mentioned. Um, and I would be ready to invite comments or questions. Well, first, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if anyone has questions for Fran, just shoot a hand up and I'll run over with the microphone. <laughs> um, I was just wondering what street the Sea Cliff and the North Shore restaurant were on. Um, you know, the, the Sea Cliff Inn was on um, Cliff Road, and the North Shore restaurant is the building that now houses American Seasons Restaurant. At the, at the foot of um, Center Street, Chester Street. It's it's complicated intersection. So the, the home, you said the home of the eccentric maiden aunt who sat in all the chairs was removed. Was it removed to another part of a different it neighborhood? Might, it might well have because Nantucket houses are so, seldom simply demolished as the Sea Cliff Inn actually was. They usually, the building material is so dear. Um, but all I can find in the records about it is that it was removed. I have to say for quite a few years I thought it had burned down, but um, removed doesn't really mean burned down. I think, and I, and I don't find any record in, you know, there's actually an inquiry mirror history of fires in Nantucket. Don't find, I don't find that house burning down there. So I think it most likely was either moved, you know, whole or taken apart and the pieces taken to be used in some other building. Fran? Mm. Hi, over here, Bill. Hi, Bill. Thank you very much, and Alan, too, for the uh, publication. But the, uh, I'm curious, a fire engine in front of the hotel on fire certainly looks like the one you showed later. Yeah. But do you have any idea what building that was or if it, it was even on the island? Well, we did have other big wooden hotels. There were some in Sconset. Uh, and I haven't done a search of what they all look like, but my, my thought is that maybe it's a, uh, a fire at another hotel on the island. I mean, the, the, the fire engine looks like a Nantucket fire engine, and the photographer operated on Nantucket. So I don't think it's here. I wondered if it was the Springfield house. No, it's not. I, I know for sure that's not what it was. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the fort that was built on Gull Island in the very yeah. early days? Uh, yeah, that's from Obed Macy. 
and uh, I can't quote it exactly, but he said that um, people, they weren't afraid of the Indians, they were afraid of the Spanish, <laughs> because <laughs> England and Spain were at war then, and so they had created on what was then called Gardner's Island, that we now call Gull Island, a repository for valuables, so that if the Spanish came ashore on Nantucket, they could protect their valuables. Uh, Libby Oldham asked me if we had time, if I would talk about one other thing, but it's something there aren't any photos of, and that's the story of Greenwich Village. Uh, it's a development that didn't happen. Um, There's, we have absolutely nothing in the image archive that would really help with the slideshow. The, the developer was Walter Brock, and the name was Greenwich Village, and apparently Mr. Brock envisioned something like the Underhill Cottages in Sconset. And they were going to be located behind the oldest house. And uh, he drew up a plan with all the lots and all the streets, and they all had very British names. And he began advertising his 36 lots uh, in 1923. And 20 were designated for cottages, they're residential, and each purchaser was to build a bungalow or a cottage on the lot within two years. And then the balance of the lots were to be used for shops, a village workshop, a playground, and parkland. And the first cottage there was erected in 1924 but it just didn't take off. And then came the Depression, and Greenwich Village came to very little, so the only street of the original ones planned is the access way from North Liberty. It's a cul-de-sac called Piccadilly Road. Um, and then Brock himself took ill, and with what his obituary described as a lingering illness, his wife actually died first, and um, when he died, his house, land, and several lots in Greenwich Village were sold off to pay his debts. But Libby was very anxious that somehow or other put Greenwich Village on the record. <laughs> the, the other thing I might tell you about, I, I began to, I, I knew about the original inhabitants of the Paddock house. Uh, Paddock family, Nathaniel Paddock bought the Jethro Coffin house from the Coffins quite early and moved in and then his family just grew and grew. And so he began in 1726 building another house in front. Um, but I was like, what about the last inhabitants? And I, I knew that the last inhabitant was a Mr. Calloway, and so I began looking up him. Um, and Robert Calloway was one of four children, and they had been raised in the house. Their parents had acquired it. And um, the original Robert Calloway had come to Nantucket around 1800, married a Nantucket woman, started a family, and then it was 1818 when he purchased the Paddock House. Um, and then his son uh, grew up to marry into the Coffin family. He married Eliza Coffin, who was descended directly from Tristram and Dionys, but laterally from Jethro and Mary. And um, so the Paddock House passed through a couple of generations of Calloways, and then Robert Calloway was born in 1850. And there are just a few things we know about this last resident of the lost paddock house. He was reportedly backward in school and was finally given what today we would call a social promotion to move him on. At the age of 21, he fell from a wagon and the wagon wheel ran over his leg, breaking it very badly, so he probably was lame. Uh, in 1895, he and a number of other neighborhood men who lived in the area worked together to improve Sunset Hill Lane, and they all submitted bills for their labor and materials for the job, and Callaway's bill was for $1.50. 
Uh, five years later, a storm blew a section of the roof off the paddock house where he was by then living alone. And I don't suppose a dollar fifty would go very far to fixing the roof. By 1911, Robert Calloway was close to $25 in arrears on his property tax and unable to pay. So the town put the house and some of his land up for auction, at which point his nephew, Clinton Calloway, and other members of the family acted through a middleman to pay the tax and keep the house and some other property from being taken away. So Calloway continued to live in the old house until one morning in June 1914, he was found dead in bed. Now, a couple of years later, just before those baseball games were photographed, Anna Starbuck Jenks, who was a custodian of the Jethro Coffin House, the oldest house, wrote a somewhat indignant letter to the inquiring mirror that she had found evidence of a fire having been set overnight with the charred remains in the middle of Sunset Lane, as she put it, within two yards of the chain of outbuildings belonging to the old unoccupied Callaway house. And she blamed it on rowdy boys who had been hanging out on the baseball field behind the oldest house when she had closed it up the day before. Uh, and then in 1927, the old house was taken apart and parts of it were incorporated into the Jethro Coffin House and everybody forgot about it and forgot about Robert Calloway too. So, uh, so we have one more? Yeah. No? Any takers? Well, thank you so much again for speaking with us today about the North Shore.